اللهم أمن علينا بصفاء المعرفة وهب لنا تصحيح المعاملة فيما بيننا وبينك على الكتاب والسنة وارزقنا صدق التوكل عليك وحسن ظن بك وأمن علينا بكل ما يقربنا إليك مقرونا بعواف الدارين يا أرحم الراحمين All praise is due to Allah who has revealed himself to mankind in a plethora of exquisite names despite the unicity of his pristine essence in everything he has a sign that indicates that he is the one. Serene blessings of peace and security upon our beloved Muhammad, the best and most beloved to Allah of his creation, and Allah knows best where to place his message. He is Allah's gift of mercy to the world and the stellar example of humanity. Verily in the Messenger of Allah you have a goodly example for those who hope in Allah. O oh Allah, bestow upon us the purity of knowing and give us the rectification of the business between us and you in accordance with the book and the sunnah. Sustain us with honesty in our reliance upon you and with good opinion in your regard. Bestow upon us everything that will draw us nearer to yourself, joined with good health in the two houses of this life and the next. Ameen. So we're still in the chapter of Mujahada, spiritual struggle, spiritual effort, putting in the work to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say that a person doesn't complete the path until they have experienced being drawn to Allah magnetically, like being pulled in the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, it comes easy for you. you. Wake up at Fajr without an alarm, right? You feel like you want to pray to Hajjah. You feel like you want to fast all day, okay? This is perhaps a certain phase of a person's life. But there will also have to be a phase if a person is going to be complete in their understanding of the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There has to be a time when it doesn't come that easy, right? When the nafs is heavy, when the nafs is slow, when you have to actually drag yourself, push yourself, convince yourself, maybe outsmart your own ego, right? In order to do things that will bring health to your heart. And here's the mujahida. Mujahida is the work, disciplining the soul, disciplining the ego, holding oneself to those things that are not necessarily pleasant, doing what needs to be done, struggling to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the ahadith that Imam al nawawi will bring in this chapter, Allah yarhamu, are about what mujahida is, and some of them are encouraging you to, or us, to put in some mujahida, put in some work in getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Again, we'll do the Senate again this week. So, we're narrating the Riyadh al-Salihin, first from Dr. Nuruddin Itab, Hafizahullah, who narrates from the Muhaddith Abdullah Siraj al -Din. We'll also narrate it from the Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Muti al Hafiz, Hafizahullah, who narrates from Muhammad Abu Khair Midani. عن عبد الله السكري عن عبد الرحمن الكزبري the grandson of Hafid عن مصطفى الرحمتي عن الشيخ الشيخ الفقيه عبد الغني النابوسي عن النجم محمد الغزي عن والده البدر الغزي عن شيخ الإسلام زكريا الأنصاري رحمة الله عليه ورضي الله عنه عن الحافظ الشهاب أحمد بن حجر عن أبي إسحاق بن إبراهيم التنوخي عن علاء الدين علي بن العطار عن الإمام المحدث الفقي يحيى بن شرف النووي who narrates with his chain to the Sahabi Abdullah ibn Mas'ud 
in the ninth hadith of the chapter, in the 103rd hadith that we've read so far in Riyadh al-Salihin, Mabrukeen. Ibn Mas'ud says, Sallaytu ma'an Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laylatan fa'atal al-qiyam. I prayed along with the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam one night and he stood for a long, long time. He made the qiyam portion very, very long. Hatta hamamtu bi amri su. Until I had the idea, I almost did something really bad. <laughs> so he's narrating it, and the people that he's narrating it to, uh, or he's telling the story to, or the episode to, said, What were you about to do? He said, Hamamtu an ajlisa wa ada'ahu. I almost decided to just sit down and leave him, right? Because he was standing for longer than I could handle it. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So even Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had to do some wajahada, right? With Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he put in the work and he put in the time. Huh? It probably helped seeing a Mustafa every day when you wake up in the morning. Right? That will help a little bit. SubhanAllah. Inshallah, Allah will make it so that we see Sayyidina Muhammad Alayhi will make all your worries go away. In the 10th hadith from Anas radiallahu anhu, an Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, Three things will follow the deceased person as he's being carried to his grave. Ahluhu wa ma'aluhu wa amaluhu. Or into the afterlife as well. Fayarjiru ithnani wa yabqa wahid. So three things will follow him his family, his wealth, and his works. And two will go back, and one is going to stay behind. Yarjiru ahluhu wa ma'aluhu wa yabqa amaluhu. His family and everything he had is going to go back where it came from after they drop him off, right? At the bus stop to the Akhirah. And one thing is going to stay behind, and that's his works. So this is an encouragement for us to get busy and try to get some good works in. Try to do some good things just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an investment in your retirement fund, right? Someone wants to have like a cushy retirement? Well, here it is. Because the works that you do sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for anyone else or anything else, but because it's the right thing to do. Because it's a good thing to do. Huh? And not ruining those actions by bringing wrong intentions in or doing it in a way that's not going to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or doing it in a way that's going to bring harm to other people. Because we can ruin our good efforts. We go to all this effort. We do all of these things to huh, bring something good to the community. Bring something good to the world or the neighborhood or people in our lives. And then we ruin it. By either not understanding how to do it right. Or hurting someone's feelings in the process. Making someone feel small in the process. Uh, having intentions to show off, you know, or for recognition. Right? That's not going to be there for you when you get into the grave. And that's one place we're going to get into. Huh? And it can be, you can have, you know, some good square footage in there. Or it could be tight, you know. So, uh, if you didn't like the place that you lived in in the dunya, you could have like a bigger spot huh? in the barzakh, if you like. And it could be comfortable. Because when we do these good actions that are wholesome and good in and of themselves, they are a comfort. They are more anis for us in the grave. You know? And this is just smart. This is why the believer is kayyusun fatin. Intelligent and perspicacious. And not a bag of cotton. No? <laughs> a lot of us. Allah inspire us. Mm -hmm. Give us some sadad, some right and correct in the things that we choose to do. Mm -hmm. The 11th hadith, also from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, 
He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Jannatu Akrabu ila ahadikum min shiraki na'lihi. We all know this one. Paradise is closer to one of you than the strap of his own shoe. Or his shoelaces. Right? Which is pretty close. Jannah is that close. It's that close because life is short. Or it's that close because you don't know when you're going to die. Inshallah, we make it home safely tonight. And we live to make some mujahada for another day. Make an effort for another day. Huh? It's that close. But then he goes on to say, before we get too excited, huh? And the fire is just like that, between the two. And that's where your life is. Ultimately, in the greater scheme of life, you're between those two things. So, don't lose sight of that. On the Thursday night class last week, we uh, brought a narration from Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, uh, in which Jibreel says to the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, Ya Muhammad, Muhammad, live, right, as much as you want, as long as you want, but you're going to die, right, and know that you're going to die. Uh, befriend whoever you want, but know that you're going to leave them, you know. So that's also what we're being told here. You're between these two, so make sure that you keep that ultimate end in mind. The Muslim may do a good job at enjoying life. Right? The Muslim may have a great time and do all types of interesting and exciting things, mashallah. But the believer knows that there's an ultimate, huh? there are ultimate ends that have to be accounted for. He doesn't lose sight of them. He doesn't throw themselves into the life of the dunya to the extent where they become in forgetful of what? Forgetful of Allah. Forgetful of the ultimate scheme of the universe. But more importantly, forgetful of themselves. Because if you forget yourself, all of those other things are not going to come to pass. Because who are you harming at the end of the day? At the end of the day, you harm yourself. And at the end of the day, it's you standing. And you can't get rid of yourself. There's no way. In the ultimate scheme of the universe, and not in beyond the universe, right? Because our reality goes beyond the known universe. Curved space and all of these different types of new uh, ideas about quantum physics and uh, so on. Look. Curved space actually only supports the Muslim per uh, perception of reality, right? Because what they're trying to say is that the universe is finite, and that's a problem for believers, maybe believers of Western religions, right? Because we all assume that the universe is finite, right? It's not a problem for us if the universe is not infinite. We never thought it was, right? So that doesn't ruin our sort of worldview of, of faith. The ultimate scheme of the universe, you can't get rid of yourself. You could disappear yourself vis-a-vis -vis other people around you, the community around you, your family, the people who know you. But in the ultimate scheme of things, the Radamat say that even if a person had themselves chopped up into little pieces and thrown to the four corners huh, uh, of the, uh, or the four winds, as it were, Allah will still put them all back together and stand them straight up on the Day of Judgment. We return to Allah and we stand there. So we don't lose sight of that. That's what it means to be smart and that's what it means to be intelligent. Any other type of intelligence is less than that. No. It's not at that level. That is ultimate intelligence. So you return back to yourself. You return back to yourself. And you have to get that straight. What do they say in Western medicine? Or classical medieval medicine? Or ancient medicine? Physician, heal thyself. There's not a lot we can do for others, right? If we can't first get ourselves straight. Allah help us. Allah help us to get ourselves straight. The 12th hadith from 
Rabi'at ibn Ka'b ibn al-Assami, who was a servant of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and among the people of the Sufa, Abu Firas. So he lived, he had no home, he was right, one of the homeless of Medina. And they camped out in a special spot uh, in the masjid. And Rabi'ah used to spend his time serving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Kuntu abitu ma'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another a narration from Rabi'ah, uh, he said, I would sleep on his doorstep and I could hear him in the middle of the night saying, Subhan Rabi al-A'la, right? Sami Allah liman hamida, alhamdulillahi Rabi al and so on reciting. So one night, فَأَتَيْعَاتِيَهُ بِوَدُوْئِهِ So wadu, what's the difference between wudu and wadu? Does anybody know? Wadu, we know what wudu is, it's how to make the ritual ablution, but wadu, with a fetha on the wow, is the water that will be used in the ablution. Wadu. So I would bring him the water for his ablution or any other needs that he had, and he said to me, right, one night, send me, ask me. Rabi'ah knew exactly what was going on here. Huh? Imagine if Rasulullah turns to you and says, All right, ask me anything you want. So, what's on your mind, Rabi'ah? So I said, As'aluka murafaqataka bit fil jannah. I ask you for your companionship in the jannah. SubhanAllah. He said, Awa khayra dalik? Nothing else? Right? Not a Tesla, right? Not a summer home, huh? In the Hamptons, right? He said, just that. Huh? He said, who it back? Right? That's all. Rabia understands, homeless understands the ultimate scheme of the universe. Stephen Hawking doesn't even understand this. Homeless, and he understands where the priorities are. You can't. Judge a person by their current situation. No. Because you don't know. He said, Oh, Rasulullah, the other Sahabi. He said, Oh, Rasulullah, huh? He just said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah because he was afraid of the edge of my sword. He said, Did you break open his heart and look inside? La wallahi. No. You don't know what's in a person's heart and you don't know who a person is. Only Allah knows who a person is. And how many amazing, incredible people that history would come to know and what period of life did they go through where they were mahmurin, they were hidden to the people around them. But Allah knew who they were. And Allah knew who they would become. No one knows, right? That's not something for us to worry about, though, because all we need to do is to be ma'rufin and Allah. We need to be known to Allah. That's all we need. But when it comes to judging others, we have to be very, very careful. Hmm? What is it? Ibn al-Banna al-Saqilli. There was a man, I believe that he was in Fez, but he was originally from huh? Sicilia. Where's Sicilia? Anybody? Sicily. Huh? Ibn al Banna al Sicilia. He was someone who was very poor, uh, uninteresting to anyone, went about his business, no one knew anything bad about him. And no one knew anything good about him. And he died at the end of his life. That's usually when you die. Right? <laughs> he died, and they buried him and did all of this, and they recovered what was left in his apartments. Right? And they found these treatises that he'd been writing. He was an alim from the ulama. And he wrote some of the most insightful huh, poems, huh, uh, didactic poems in 
the knowledge of Islam. And it was only after he was gone that they discovered who he was. Mabahat al Asriya. It was originally written by Ibn al Banna al Saqili. And how many great scholars have written commentaries on the Mabahat al Asriya? SubhanAllah. Who would that? That's what I want. And so the Prophet والسلام, says to Rabi'ah, فَأَعِنِّي عَلَى نَفْسِكَ بِكَثْرَةِ السُّجُودِ Okay. But just help me with yourself by making a lot of sujood. Here's what you want, and I'm going to do my best to make it happen. But just help me out and be a person who makes a lot of sujood. For Rabi'ah, it was sujood. And this advice will come in the next hadith from Thoban also. Radiallahu anhuma. Sujood is one way of serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very important way, and that's probably the target that you want to hit. But have some secret between you and Allah. Have some private goodness, good deed, or ibadah that you do that nobody knows about. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about to make it special for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If you want to get pulled along the path, right, that's a really good one. Huh? Who knows what that is? You know, one person gave water to a thirsty dog once and popped right into Jannah. Huh? For that, So you don't know what's big and what's small in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're not the judge and jury on the day of judgment. Maybe your, uh, maybe your, uh, your small, small secret between you and Allah is that you'll never uh, drop anything or leave any debris or anything like that in the masjid. Or that if you see some debris in the masjid, you'll pick it up. And that's the way you are for your entire life. Or that you'll never throw any trash on Allah's earth. Ibadur Rahman al ladina yamshuna al ardi hawna. Who knows what it is? Or maybe it's that you have a secret to hajjud. Or you have some type of... So many of the scholars, you'll hear about them in uh, the, the history of Islam that... They would sneak out of their house in the middle of the night so that no one in the house would know what they do. And they would go to a place, like maybe I've read in some places, a broken down building, right? That's just full of dirt and sand and debris and say, this is where my soul actually belongs and pray raka'at there to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know? Or some spot where you make kathra to sujood in the earth, where no one's made sujood before. SubhanAllah. But have some type of secret between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And be part of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he said he's going to look out for his people. Right? So be one of his people by being like him. Not dressing like him. Not gesturing like him. Huh? Not talking a great deal. But the most important shamila or shama'il of the Prophet والسلام, or the shama'il of his heart, how he was internally, that's what counts. That's what's important. Now, don't get caught up with the dawahir because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he's not concerned with the dawahir, with the outward. And at the end of the day, it's Allah's judgment that is important to us, and that is the greatest scheme of the universe. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. Mm -hmm. We've got some serious like quantum physics going on here tonight. <laughs> Who knew? I should get a job at MIT. <laughs> I'll tell you. In the 13th hadith from Thoban, also servants of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول عليك بكثرة السجود فإنك لن تسجد لله سجدة إلا رفعك الله بها درجة You're advised to make much prostration meaning many rakahat or if you have a chance to make sajda of tilawa 
or reciting the Quran or sajda to shukr, right? Uh -huh. There are the reasons to make sujood. And kathra to sujood though, right, is many raka'at. فَإِنَّكَ لَنْ تَسْجُدَ You do not prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a prostration except that He raises you in a station. وَحَطَّ عَنْكَ بِهَا خَطِيئًا And drops from you a fault, or a misstep, or a mistake, or a sin, and so on. And I know I could use that. Subhanallah. Number 14, from Abi Safwan Abdullah ibn Busrin al-Aslami radiyallahu anhu, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ مَنْ طَالَ عُمُرُهُ وَحَسُنَا عَمَلُهُ The best of people. So who's the best of people? Who's the best one? Well, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to tell us who the best of people is, right? The best of people are the ones who have a long life, a long life and good actions. That's the best of people. Now, and so long as the good actions are going on, if they're going to stop at any point, it's probably better for life to stop at that point too. Right? So, so long as you've got good actions going on in your life, however long it's going to be, right? To the end of the week, inshallah, inshallah we make it to the end of the week and have some good actions there. That's the best of people. Khayrun nas. And that's the ma'yar, the criterion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for bestness. 7.30, we start at 7. Okay, so we'll continue on with hadith number 15, insha'Allah. An Anasin, radiyallahu anhu, qad ghaba ammi Anas ibn Nadir, radiyallahu anhu, an qitali bajrin, faqal ya rasulallahi ghibtu an awwal qitalin qatalt al-mushrikeen. So Anis says that his uncle, also named Anis ibn Nadir, huh, was not present at the Battle of Badr. He was absent at the Battle of Badr. And he said to the Messenger والسلام, I was absent in the, fir the first time you ever fought the idolaters. أَشْهَدَنِي قِتَالَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ لَيَرَيَنَّ اللَّهُ مَا أَصْنَعُ And if Allah gave me to the ability to be there for another fight against the idolaters, idolaters I would show Allah exactly what I would do. Hmm? So now Anas ibn Nadir is ready to show and prove as it were. هَأُولَاءِ فَلَمَّا كَانَ يَوْمُ أُحُدٍ كَشَفَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ And when the day of Uhud came, the battle of Uhud, the Muslims in Keshafa, what does that mean? The battle lines of the Muslims was, uh, became vulnerable. Okay? Either there was a gap where the enemy could come through, maybe come straight to the heart of the Muslim command, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammad, which is actually what happened at Uhud, is famous for that. Huh? In Kishaf as Sufuf, right? Maybe it weakens or something like this, the lines of battle. But here they left themselves open at a particular moment. Faqala, and he said, Allahumma a'tadhiru ilayka mimma sun'a ha'ula. So the point is, is that maybe some of the Muslims. Uh, soldiers were not where they needed to be at the Battle of Uhud. So, huh? Allah, you got your feet going, bless your hands. Anas uh, ibn Nadir, he says, O oh Allah, I ask you to forgive me for what those people have done. And I am innocent from what, they've, uh, what they have done, meaning the idolaters, 
ثم تقدم فاستقبله سعد بن معاذ and then he went forward clearly all by himself uh, and he was stopped by Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and he said Sa'd he was confronted by Sa'd ibn Mu'adh the head of the Ansar and he said Sa'd ibn Mu'adh ibn Mu'adh al-jannatu al-jannatu wa rabb al-ka'bati inni ajidu rihaha min duni uhad so he's coming and the leader of the Ansar is right there and he's going to go forward, he's going to, fill, he's going to fill this gap and confront the enemy. As he's going through, the head of the Ansar is right there, uh, the leader, and he says, Ya Sa'du, I smell the fragrance of Jannah from the direction of Uhud. And Sa'd said, فَمَسْتَطَعْتُ Ya Rasulullah مَا sana." I was not able to do what Anas did. فقال أنس أنس فوجدنا به so this is Anas ibn Malik فوجدنا به بضعا وثمانين ضربة بالسيف أو تعنة برمح أو رمية بسهم so and then we found him with more than eighty wounds from swords or uh, stab stab places of being stabbed with a spear or hit with an arrow. فَوَجَدْنَاهُ قَدْ قُتِلَ وَمَثَّلَ بِهِ الْمُشْرِكُونَ And we found him, he had been killed and also mutilated by the idolaters. فَمَا عَرَفَهُ أَحَدٌ And no one could identify his body except his sister who knew his fingertips. SubhanAllah. That's some serious effort, some serious mujahada. Yeah, Rabbi. Kala Anasun Kunna Nara Al Nadunna and Nahari Hil Ayat Nazalat Fihi. And thereafter, we thought that this verse was revealed for the sake of Anas ibn Nadar. Min al Mu'minin Rijalun Sadaku Ma'ahadu Baha Ali. From among the believers are men who were honest about what they promised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, if Allah lets me join in the fight against the idolaters, huh, I will show him what I've got. And he was sought at the night and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. And he followed through in a way in which there is no doubt. The idolaters represented what? Torturing innocent people. Preventing people from having a spiritual relationship with their creator. Huh? Taking usury from people. Huh? Doing evil in society. And what is this evil? Torturing people, taking usury from people, beating slaves, and doing all of these types of things. Right? Their program was in a system that would get, eventually get rid of sla slavery. Huh? All of these awful things is what they represented. And that was the nidam or the system that they were trying to bring to bear. And where loss of life is occurring and you have a political authority, sufficient force should be used to justify the use of sufficient force. Because there's no ju you can't justify the use of sufficient force huh, without a proper political authority. Uh, in place, unless you're defending your own home. Tayyip, then using sufficient force to put a stop to this is important and necessary. Where it is not something that entails the loss of life, but it's still wronging others. Standing up against that is incredibly important. Right? And every situation has its huh, dictates according to the criteria of Islamic law. If we know and understand Islamic law properly, we can see clearly what is needed or called for if the conditions are met, and what is needed and called for if the conditions are not met to deal with different cases. Okay? But if we don't understand this well, then people make foolish and knuckle-headed huh, decisions or um, courses of action. But here, from the believers are those who 
were honest, were truthful about what they promised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, right, they say that it is about the shuhada of Ahud, right? They followed through. But at every level, there are people who are true. There are people who are honest. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. People who are true and honest about uh, following up on what they say that they're going to do. Following up on their promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Standing true by the principles of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rabbi. In the 16th hadith from Abu Mas'ud, Uqbat ibn Amrin al-Ansari radiallahu anhu who said, Lama nazalat ayatu sadaqa kunna nuhamilu ala dhuhurina Fajā'a rajulun fatasaddaqa bi shay'in kathīr faqālu murā'in Wajā'a rajulun ākhar fatasaddaqa bi sa'in faqālu inna allāha la ghaliyun an sa'i hādā When the verse of giving in charity, right, that as a good deed, was revealed we would go out and carry things for others for pay, and then huh, give in charity. We'd go out and earn money just to go, so we'd have something to give in charity. One man would show up, and he would give a whole lot of sadaqah, and people say, would say, well, that one, he's just showing off. He just wants everybody to see how much he's giving. SubhanAllah. And then another one would come up, and he'd only give, you know, about so much. Okay? And we would say that Allah's got no need of that little amount that that person gave. And the verse was revealed, الَّذِينَ يَلْمِزُونَ الْمُطَوِّعِينَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الصَّدَقَاتِ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ إِلَّا جُهْدَهُمْ Right? And those who look critically at the ones who uh, of the believers who give willingly of their charity and those who are only able to go out and maybe give as much as they are able to. Huh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, has a special reward for them. The verse of sadaqah, خُدْ مِنْ أَمْوَارِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرَهُمْ Take from their wealth or their assets, a charity that will purify them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huh, brings a recognition that uh, adding on to that previous verse, so for your science of the asbab and nuzul, the reasons for revelation, uh, this other verse comes and says that, right, to calibrate our understanding of the previous one is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying that no amount of sadaqah is insignificant. Right? This group, shouldn't be criticized for what they're doing because we don't know their intention. Right? And here the Sahaba are learning a lesson. It's okay to be wrong. The Sahabi is telling you about his own misstep, his own mistake, his own huh? faults. Right? We learned and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us and we were receptive to that learning and that understanding. SubhanAllah. And that these are included no matter what it is they're able to do. Don't think it insignificant. And don't think your own effort is insignificant. No. In the 17th hadith from Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz, عن ربيعة ibn Yazid, عن Abi Idris al-Khawlani, عن Abi Dhar, Jundab ibn Janada, رضي الله عنه, عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما يروي عن الله تبارك وتعالى. So we have a hadith Qudsi. Huh? قال Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, O my slaves, 
إِنِّي حَرَّمْتُ الظُّلْمَ عَلَى نَفْسِي I have made oppression and the wronging and abuse of others forbidden for my own self, Allah says. Meaning that any circumstance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to be in or puts you in, even if it is the abuse and the oppression of others, Allah is not abusing you. Allah is not abusing you for two reasons. First, it's impossible for Allah to abuse you. It's, a lot, uh, it's impossible for Allah to wrong you. Allah never did bad by you. Why? Because al-maliku yatasarrafu fi mulkihi ma yasha. The owner, the sovereign, does what he wants with his belongings. And the universe, the heavens and the earth and everything in between, it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever he does, you say, well, I don't like this religion. I'm going to go find another religion. Okay. Right? Go find another religion. Can you go find another religion? That's not even possible. It's not even possible to go find another religion. إِنْ لَمْ تَرْضَى بِقَضَائِي فَخْرُجْ مِنْ تَحْتِ السَّمَاءِ وَبْحَثْ عَنْ رَبِّنْ سِوَايَا If you don't like my decree, then get out from under my sky and find a God other than me, or a Lord other than me. It can't be done. But second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just in what He does. And he has rahmah in everything that he does. And he has a design and a wisdom in everything that he does. And because we rely on him, and we know what he is, and we know who he is, we know that the circumstances that he's put us in, or that he's brought us through, there is a design that is behind it. And if we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah loves us. And if we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately is doing right by us, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ultimately doing right by us. And gold doesn't shine unless it's touched by fire. The diamond is not going to glitter and glimmer or be expensive, ghali and priceless unless it's crushed. And then it becomes what it is. And never ever think that you're the only one who ever suffered. No. All great people have to suffer. And you don't know what Allah has in store for, me, for you. You can ask Allah why. And He may or may not tell you. He may or may not tell you. But if you have yaqeen and you have strength in your faith, if you have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you already know the answer. Because He wants well for you. You just have to get through it. And you have to find the wherewithal to bring the patience to bear. To use the brain that God gave you to figure out ways out. And you will become more nimble. And you will become more strong. And you will become all the better. And you know from your yaqeen and from your confidence and your literacy of Islamic teachings that huh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking you somewhere. And you know that He's not going to give you a burden that you can't bear. Even though today it seems like you can't carry it. That you might do what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, وَهَمِمْتُ بِسُوءٍ I almost did something really bad. What was, these, what was really bad in the eyes of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud? I almost sat down, put down the burden, huh? and left Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Allah, if Allah gave it to you, you can bear it. And don't step out, because huh? you can do it. It's just sometimes we forget. That's what dhikr is for. To remind. What's dhikr? Remember. Remind. A reminder. Because we forget. And these are the things that we forget. These are the things that we forget. And if you have Allah on your tongue, in the forefront of your mukh, huh? then you 
you might remember when you need to remember most, and it might carry you through. But if we don't do our dhikr, if we don't do our adhkar, if we don't do our remembering, or we, f- we go to majalis of remembrance and we forget why we're there, huh? then we're going to suffer later. You know? Mujahida. You have a program that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has you on. This is a good hadith. Let's try to finish it before we get to the end of the lesson. I like this one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I've made dhulm haram for me. And the slave that loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will follow that and try to be a refraction and to be a mirror of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that's right for the created to mirror the goodness that can only come from one source, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and say that I've too made dhulm haram for me, just as Allah made it haram for me and made it haram for himself. I will also make sure that I don't harm another person if I really want to be a Abdullah. وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ وَحَرَّمًا And I've made it haram between you. In the ultimate, ultimate scheme of the universe, it's impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to يَظْلِمُ That's the metaphysical perspective on dhul. But what's the difference between an eternal, infinite creator and the finite uh, creation. We can uh, wrong one another, and I've made it illegal, forbidden from you, min nahiyat al-shara, wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tadalamu. If you call yourselves Muslims, don't oppress other people, don't wrong other people, huh? don't mess with other people, don't take from the rizq of other people. Don't curtail the well-being of other people if you call yourselves believers. Because everyone knows this hadith. Ya ibadi kullukum dalun illa man hadaytu. My slaves, all of you are lost. All of you can't find your way in the dark, even in the middle of the broad sunlight of the midday afternoon. All of you are lost unless I guide you. Fastahduni, so ask me to guide you. Ahadikum. Ask me how to do it. But you gotta ask. You gotta know who to ask. And you gotta know what you're doing when you're asking. It can't be just through the Fatiha, through the Dua, right? It has to be, I need this, Ya Allah. I need this now, and I know where to ask. I'm asking you. And Allah will take care of you. But on His time, on His schedule, because He's the one that runs the show, and it's His show. Ya ibadi kullukum ja'i' illa man at'amtu. All of you are hungry. All of you go hungry. All of you are going to go hungry except the one that I feed. If you get fed today, Allah fed you. And we forget. Eating the power bar on the way to work, mashallah. You know, or you get that pang of hungry hunger and you stop and you grab something and now you're not hungry anymore. Good. Mashallah. Stay away from the ice cream. Right? After a certain age. After 30, don't eat ice cream. Right? But, uh, huh? But don't forget where it came from. No, don't forget where it came from. And then also remember that from huh, the literacy of Islam, that you can't appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless you appreciate the people that put the food on your table. Mm-hmm. So it all goes together, it all works as a whole. Fastat'imuni ut'imkum. Ask me to feed you, and I'll feed you. Ya ibadi kullukum aarin illa man kasautu. My slaves, all of you are naked, except for the one that I clothe. There's a lot of different types of nakedness. Right? There's that nakedness where the person wants to go for a job interview and does not have anything appropriate to wear for that job interview. And there's the nakedness of 
not having any of your life be mastur, right? Or, or, or not having privacy, right? That's also nakedness, right? There's different types of nakedness, subhanAllah. All of you are naked except for the ones that I have clothed, huh? فَاسْتَكْسُونِي أَكْسُكُمْ So ask for me to cover you, right? Ya Sattar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who veils huh, the faults of his slaves. One shaykh used to say, Alhamdulillah alladhi ma ja'ala lidhunubi ra'iha kariha. All praise is due to Allah who is not made for sins a foul odor. Because then we'd all be in trouble. Yes, it does. Ya ibadi innakum. تخطئون بالليل والنهار وأنا أغفر الذنوب جميعا My slaves, you make mistakes and sins all night and all day. And if you think you don't, oh, I made it through last night. No, 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 no. That's the biggest sin, thinking that you made it through. Right? You're a sin. Subhanallah. No one should think. Some, 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 sometimes we do, or some of us do, think that, oh, I'm doing good, so now I've got nothing left to do but point my finger at other people. And you know what they say in our country, if you point a finger at somebody, there's four more pointed back at you, right? Yeah, I don't mean. But this is where we have to be. You're making mistakes, you're making sins all night and all day, and Allah says, and I forgive all sins. That's where we need to be, is what I need from Allah. And let my brother or my sister be where they need to be. This is Islamic theology. Huh? To be wrapped up in what I need Allah to do for me. Huh? And my mistakes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. To be wrapped up in one's own mistakes and not busy with someone else's mistakes. That's Christianity. Okay? And now when y'all hear me saying that modern Muslims are trying to make Islam into Protestantism, watch. And now you know. Right? It's not about Is Islamic theology is not be about being busy huh, with other people's mistakes. What did uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do when Ma'iz came and said, huh? Ya Rasulullah, I mean, I committed zina. Right? And the Prophet turns away. Right? And he says, no, no, he tries to get in front of him, I committed zina. Right? He said, la'allaka qabbalt. And maybe you kissed her. He said, no, 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 I committed zina. Huh? And he's trying to turn away. He said, well, maybe, maybe you fakhaltaha. Maybe you just rubbed up against her. He said, no, 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 I committed zina. Right? And Rasulullah is trying to turn away from him. He doesn't want Ma'az to come and say this. And then he says to Ma'az, Abika Junoon, are you crazy? Because if you're crazy, Rufiyat al right? You're not responsible. To the point where some of our scholars said that it is the responsibility of a Muslim judge to say to the person who's brought before him in a case of, ad of, of adultery or fornication, huh, maybe you kissed and that's all. Meaning, just say you kissed her and go, right? Maybe this, maybe, you know, less than that. And then the judge is supposed to say, Abika Junu, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? So that the person can say, you know what? I think I lost my mind, right? Why? Because the, what's private is not our business, the privacy of others. We have privacy. For any of you all who are with us on the group, if you remember the piece that I sent out of the poetry of Imam al-Shafi'i, he says, Oh my eye, speaking to his own eye, know that other people have eyes. Huh? Preoccupy yourself with your business, not other people's business. That is Islamic theology. 
we would like to have a public space that's PG rated. Right? That's our business. We don't want a bunch of stuff in front of our kids. Let them be raised up with a little bit of innocence and purity, if that's possible. But we don't live in a, a world that is innocent or pure. We don't. Tell me where is innocent and pure. Tell me one place. Don't say Mecca. Don't say Medina. Tell me one place that is innocent and pure, because if it's innocent and pure to your eyes, there's someone else who's suffering from a lot of evil and a lot of hurt, even in Mecca and Medina. And I'll tell you stories. Huh? So we don't live in a place that's innocent and pure. But if anything, our responsibility is to do what we can to allow children to have a life and come up uh -huh. safely. Huh? Knowing full well that there's many who won't and we're not going to be able to stop that, but that's our responsibility. Right? Let us not fall short in that responsibility like so many others do. But after that, we're not people who make ourselves feel better by finding someone that we can look down on. Oh, good, someone just came in who's got darker skin than me. Now I'm the, the light-skinned one. Yeah, us light-skinned people, you know, we got to watch out for these other people. SubhanAllah, it's, uh, what do you call it, it's, it's a, a spectrum and if you can't see, there are people who are dead to beauty. There are people whose, whose hearts are dead, their minds are dead, they've got no eye of aesthetic. And they, there's so much beauty around them and they don't see it, they don't understand it, and that's why they're not art critics. Or maybe those are the people who go and become art critics, <laughs> right? But the point is, is that there are people who have got no taste. Huh? And they you know, talk trash about food that healthy people know is like a really wonderful dish. Huh? Those people should not cook for me, right? Or us, you know. So some people are dead and they shouldn't be fooled into thinking somehow they're superior. That's a nux in the person if they're looking down on someone else. And what we need to stop, right? Look, none of the masajid in North America, you know, are really interested in working with me, right? So that's good. So, y'all put yourself in a bad situation then. I'll just speak my mind, and if you don't like it, don't invite me, right? But you gotta stop looking at the cars that people drive in the parking lot. Stop. Stop talking about cars that people drive. Stop judging other believers at your masjid, at your Islamic school. There are people at the Islamic schools in North America, and I'm new here, I'm just noticing what goes on, who sit out, and they're not making sure the kids get to their ride, okay? They're taking notes, who drives up in this, and who drives up in that, and I think a lot of people here probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Huh? And then they judge people and treat people according to what type of car they drive. What type of car did Rasulullah usually drive? He usually drove a buffalo, a mule. And nary a one of us wants to be caught dead riding on a mule. Okay? That is not classy. But it was good enough for Rasulullah Qaswa was for special occasions. Right? Qaswa huh? was for special occasions. SubhanAllah. But he usually huh, rode on a buffalo mm -hmm. called Durdur. That's not, that's not sexy either, right? But subhanAllah, later on, despite the fact, huh, the, the, the scholars of hadith would say that one of the reasons for not taking hadith with a, from a person is if they gallop on a donkey, right? Or a mule, because did you ever see someone galloping on a donkey, right? Or a mule, it, it, it's, it's not a good look, right? SubhanAllah. You know, but if I had the salah and the taqwa and the righteousness of one of those students of knowledge from way back in Khair al Qurun that galloped on a donkey, I would be very happy. Right? SubhanAllah. If that was my only problem I had to worry about, 
But we need to stop judging people by the clothes that they wear. If we're not smart enough to hear what someone is saying, to hear who someone is, then we're not smart enough to judge someone either. You know? SubhanAllah. People have a lot of people are very needy. You know? And maybe we need to address what we think it is we need to put ourselves up by putting other people down. So let's finish this out and maybe we can pick up uh, next time we come because we have to wind it down now. Allah Yubarak Fikum. He says, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, so ask forgiveness from me and I'll forgive you. SubhanAllah. Ya ibadi innakum, I would like to have a mawla like this. I would love to have a God like this. I would love to worship someone like this. This would inspire me to make a little bit of mujahida if the one that I was worshipping said this to me. And it came in a chain of narration that I could be confident in. It just so happens that that is the case. Alhamdulillah. Ya ibadi innakum lan tablughu dhurri fatadurruni. You know what? We should stop because I don't want to just go over this quickly. You can't hurt Allah. You'll never reach the point where you can hurt me, Allah says. So that, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to think about. Allah yubarak fikum wa ahsana ilaykum. Allah put ihsan in your homes. Amen. Allah put ihsan in your cars. Amen. Allah put ihsan in your tank. Amen. Right? Allah gets you the extra distance and carry you all the way to where you need to get to with His pleasure and His contentment and a little bit of peace of heart and mind in your hearts and minds, in the hearts and minds of your families. Mm -hmm. Allah, give us enlightenment. Allah, help us grow from these, from these uh, uh, sessions that we have mm -hmm. so that we go out stronger believers than when we came in, more mm -hmm. beloved to Allah subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala because we have strong hearts mm -hmm. and stronger minds, mm -hmm. right? Which is more important than many, many other types of strengths. Mm -hmm. Allah, bless us and bless you all and bless mm -hmm. your masajid mm -hmm. and this masjid and mm -hmm. the people here. Ayyadakum Allah wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.